Peggy, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. We'd like to ask you to spend a few minutes giving us an overview of our subject today, and then we'll go to questions. Thank you very much for inviting me. So the first question you posed is, what is the Securities and Exchange Commission? Uh, that commission was established by the Franklin Roosevelt administration in response to the stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression. In 1934, Roosevelt signed the Securities Exchange Act, which created the SEC as a independent agency with a bipartisan five member commission. That means that a chairman is appointed by the current president and there are four other members at no more of which, um, no more than three of which can come from the same political party. This, this act, the 1934 act gave the SEC extensive powers to regulate the securities industry, including the New York Stock Exchange and also allowed them to bring minor civil charges against individuals and companies who were regulated by the SEC and who had violated the securities law. The SEC is responsible for monitoring and regulating financial markets, and today it is one of the most powerful of all government agencies. Now, after the financial crisis of 2008, Congress passed the Dodd-Frank legislation, which controversially expanded the SEC's power to charge people who are not even regulated by the agency and bring them into in-house adjudications. And that's what brought the case of SEC versus Jarkasi to the courts. Um, the, the, in, these in-house courts are, uh, have administrative law judges and um, they, um, they are appointed and hired by the agency um, and they are not in a separate branch of government the way that the constitution provides that the judicial branch shall be a separate branch of government. Now, George Jarkissi was charged in 2013, alleging uh, that he had made misrepresentations about the value of his fund. Uh, and he was brought before uh, these administrative law judges in an in-house adjudication. He sued right away to try to secure a real federal court in a separate branch of judgment, uh, a separate branch of government, but was, that was unsuccessful. So um, he had to endure a, uh, a proceeding where um, the SEC had charged him. Uh, then they brought him before a judge that was employed by the very commission who charged him and who was now his judge and would make all findings. There is no jury in these proceedings. So consider what this means for Americans because Americans are 10 times more likely to be brought before an administrative law judge than a real judge, a shocking fact that I did not learn until about five or six years ago. So the SEC makes the rules and then it enforces the rules and then it prosecutes the rules and then it judges whether you violated the rules and it serves as your first court of appeal um, if you disagree with their charges. So this is um, a troubling, uh, system because it puts the prosecutorial, judicial, and enforcement and punishment power all in the same hands of, of one agency. So you will not be surprised to learn that the um, SEC wins in its in-house court somewhere between 90 and 100 percent of the time. Whereas if you are charged in a real court before a real judge in a separate branch of, judge, of um, government, that uh, success rate for the agency is more like 60, between 60 and 70%. So this makes a real difference. And what makes uh, George Jarkissi's case particularly compelling is, as I mentioned earlier, he tried to get access to real unbiased courts for his prosecution and was denied that uh, by a District of Columbia Circuit Court that included Brett Kavanaugh on the court. And six other circuit precedents followed that. But, and this, this changed the landscape, in April of 2023, in a case that I was leading, the Supreme Court unanimously overruled uh, the holding 
uh, that had denied him access to a real court in 2014. And um, it reversed the law of six circuit courts of appeals and said people charged by an ALJ, before an ALJ, may go to a real court to challenge whether that is constitutional, including whether it denies them jury trial rights. So um, the Jerkesy case could be a historic step in restoring jury trial rights and also the separation of powers. There are three issues in the Jerkesy case, but the jury trial issue is probably the most prominent one. I attended the argument uh, at the Supreme Court and that the jury trial question took up virtually the whole argument by the court. Now, I was pleased to see on your Constituting America uh, a picture of George Washington because this was a matter of particular concern to him. Uh, he was very concerned as early as 1774, so this is before the revolution, about what he called quasi courts that bypass due process and jury trial rights and put the colonists under the thumb of unaccountable British officials. This was a very sore spot for the colonists. Um, they, uh, he wrote to a friend saying uh, that these quasi uh, courts uh, involved transporting American offenders into other colonies or across the ocean to Great Britain for trials where it is impossible from the nature of the trial that justice can be obtained. Now that concern of George Washington in 1774 was directly translated into the Declaration of Independence, which said, and I, this is a quote, the king is, quote, transporting us beyond the seas to be tried for pretended offenses and depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. Washington's farewell address also warned against encroachments by one branch of government upon the powers of another. He said, and this is a quote again, caution in those entrusted with administration to not encroach upon the powers of the other branches is essential. The spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all the departments into one and thus to create a real despotism. In the Federalist Papers, the founders said that when you put the uh, lawmaking power, the adjudication power, the prosecution power, and the punishment power in one agency, that is the very, de very definition of tyranny. And yes, that is how the SEC works. So George Jarkissi's fight, which has um, gone on from 2014 to the present day, so nearly 10 years, to secure his right to be tried before a jury of his peers goes back to these concerns by the founding fathers about these, quote, quasi courts that charge us with pretend offenses. Because another problem with the SEC is that it, uh, it sometimes regulates by what they call guidance or suggestions or things that are not law. And, and people find that they are uh, charged before a very powerful agency and they do not have the benefit of a real judge and a real jury to vindicate whether they have indeed violated the law or whether this is something that the SEC just thinks is a violation. And um, I think this came to a head. Um, this was the Dodd-Frank legislation of 2010 and prominent people such as Mark Cuban were finding that, the, that if they got a jury trial, they were able to be fully exonerated by a jury. And so the SEC concerned that it was uh, losing cases in court, started to move these cases before its administrative law judges, where it then had uh, somewhere between 90 and 100% success rate. This should be a matter of concern to all Americans. None of us should be brought before an agency, a very powerful agency that gets to make the rules, that gets to apply the rules, prosecute the rules, adjudicate the rules, and be the first court of appeals if you have violated the rules. That is illogical and um, unjust. So the Jarky C case is very important. There are also two other issues in the case. 
One is called delegation. And the question there is whether the SEC could always have charged Mr. Jarkissi in a real court, but it just didn't. And is it lawful under the constitution for the agency to get the choice between bringing him in the two uh, in one of the two tribunals? And uh, the uh, US Supreme Court certified that question as to whether in fact Congress had delegated that power to the agency to get to pick its tribunal. In addition, the administrative uh, law judges are tenure protected, which means that you, they just can't be fired. It's, they have multiple layers, at least three layers as I count it, of tenure protection. So these are people who possess enormous powers and are not subject to control by the executive, even though they are in the executive branch. So many concepts that are essential to the separation of powers and our system of government are um, uh, presented in the Jarkissi case. And I'm um, very anxious to see how the court rules. Um, I think it was uh, as, as um, some of the writings around the time that the case was granted certification by the Supreme Court, a lot of people see this as a seismic um, decision, one that will, um, I see it as one that will restore our system of government and the separation of powers into three branches of government. Others have, have uh, issued very critical uh, statements about this is going to sort of take apart um, the administrative state. Uh, I think those are concerns are, are grossly overblown. And in fact, the effects on justice will be very salutary and mean that the Americans who, as I say, are 10 times more likely to be brought into these quasi courts where they are denied uh, the protections of the federal rules of civil procedure, the federal rules of evidence, are subject to deadlines that fa favor the agency, that um, have uh, uh, procedures that go on for years, I mean, consider this, the, the SEC started investigating Mr. Jarkissi in 2011. It didn't charge him until 2014. And here we are 10 years later. Oh. And uh, the appellate court said he was denied basic constitutional pr pr protections. So this should be a matter of concern to all Americans. Well, thank you, Peggy. That, I mean, you did a great job of taking a, a pretty complicated issue and boiling it down. And I love the tie back to the Declaration of Independence and the Federalist Papers and, and George Washington himself. We're going to go straight to Kristen because uh, Kristen has to be off a little early today. And uh, so, Kristen, I know you've got some questions lined up. I do. Um, thank you so much for that explanation. Um, I guess my my big question here is, how is it that we allow these bureaucratic agencies in the executive branch to exist? I mean, the Constitution is pretty clear. It, it doesn't allow anyone but Congress to pass laws. And in this case, like you said, it seems that the SEC is judge, jury, and executioner. Um, it, it's very clearly violating the principle of the separation of power. So how is it that we've, we've allowed this to stray so far down the road? Well, um, as the lower court, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals um, recognized that these courts came into existence in the 1930s in response to uh, the Great Depression. And initially they did not have great power. Um, very often they were um, seen as a court in which you could appeal whether your registration had been denied and sort of licensing issues that do not, um, imperil your life, liberty, or property, but is just simply a, a means in, by which you practice in a particular in, industry. But like many things, um, power encroaches. Um, I read, I think I use the word encroachment at least twice um, from George Washington, but Alexander Hamilton and James Madison also are, were very concerned that once you give power to a quasi court like this, uh, the spirit of encroachment of power will expand. And that's exactly what it did in Dodd-Frank. So that meant persons like George Jarkissi, who wasn't even a registered um, uh, person with the, the agency, could be hauled before it and charged uh, with what is not necessarily even a securities law violation, 
um, and then uh, put through years of what I can only describe as Kafka-esque adjudication, where all the deck is completely stacked against you. You um, have a very short time to prepare your case. You're not protected by rules of evidence, rules of civil procedure. Um, you have a foreshortened time for trial, and then the commission can take years. The commission sat on George Darkus's appeal for seven years. That's unheard of in a real court of law where the administrative con of conference in the federal courts, they have a, about a two and a quarter, two and a half average time from the time the case is brought to resolution. Whereas these administrative tribunals are, are well, Nobody even knows that this happens. When I argued the, Co the Cochran case before 16 judges, I went through George Jarkissi's case and said he languished for seven years. My client had languished for six years. A guy named uh, Ray Lucia, it had been something like eight years. A guy named um, Vandermeer, it was 10 years. And honestly, I don't think these federal judges had any idea that people could go into these very Kafka-esque, very biased, very one-sided proceedings, and they never come out whole. And so in some instances never come out alive if they're old enough, and they certainly come out impoverished. Uh, Justice Gorsuch, just last term in that same case, the one that I had handled, talked about the ability of the agencies to outlast and outspend the people they charge means that they are trapped there and and um, and either have to settle or you know submit to the agency's power, and that is a deeply troubling thing. So if if we win in Jarkasi, if Mr. Jarkasi wins his case, it means he can go back and, and to a real court where his case would be resolved in around two years, and he would have the right of trial by jury, which saved Mark Cuban and many others who have been charged by the SEC and then found to not have violated the securities laws. So hopefully, we're obviously hoping that you win and that uh, this case turns out favorable. But in the case that they rule in favor of the SEC, what what are the next steps? Where does it go from there? Does, does the SEC just gain more power, more authority uh, in these cases? Does it just maintain where it's at, seeing as it's quite big already? But what happens afterwards? That's a very good question. Um, I work for the New Civil Liberties Alliance, and we are trying to um, uh, get a what we call a civil liberties movement going. And um, that includes... Um, uh, going on campuses with uh, kangaroos, uh, including a guy dressed up as a kangaroo, <laughs> who it's to fight these kangaroo courts that uh, deliver predetermined results. Um, everyone in the world should be troubled by any court that where the outcome is known ahead of time just because of where you are. And so um, if should uh, the Jarkasi uh, decision come down such that the SEC wins, um, we will be seeking to um, do everything we can to build a civil liberties movement to change that around. And I think that is the, uh, and, and we could go to Congress as well and see if they, uh, what they think, because one of the problems with this case is not even Congress can take away your right to a jury trial. That's the very meaning of a constitutional right is you have that right to a jury trial and Congress can't pass a law and say, oh, well, you know, in this in these cases, you don't. It can't do that <laughs> because or except by a constitutional amendment. That's what they would have to do. They would have to amend the Constitution to take away the Seventh Amendment and Sixth Amendment rights to jury trials. Lacking that, even Congress can't take it away. So for the court to rule in favor of the SEC here would be um, shocking appalling and time for action. As it should, yes. <laughs> um, and so you you talk about this difference between elected government officials in Congress who have certain constitutional rights, and then we have the unelected uh, agency bureaucrats, people from the SEC. Uh, it, what are the what are the broader implications uh, when it comes to this case uh, regarding government regulation and this balance of power between the elected officials and the unelected bureaucrats? 
How does that? Do I... <laughs> well, the, the best way to restore the balance of power is to remember that only Congress can make law. And Congress loves this delegation to the administrative agencies. They'll pass a law that says, well, you know, the FCC can delegate in the public interest or um, the EPA uh, can do laws that uh, help improve the environment or some vague kind of thing like that. And the West Virginia versus EPA case of two terms ago made clear that those kinds of vague delegations do not give agencies power to make the law. Congress has to be specific um, and it cannot de delegate to agencies this broad lawmaking power because, uh, you know, look at it, uh, for example, this way. Let's say um, people decided, well, we don't like these securities fraud people. We want to take away their trial by jury. To do that correctly, you would have to go to Congress and say, we want you to repeal the Seventh Amendment. And any number of state legislatures would ha also have to approve that. I, I'm pretty certain that somewhere along the line, someone would say, why are we taking away jury trial <laughs> protections for this subset of people? That doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. And so that, that would uh, prevent that from happening. And that's what we always have to remember. These unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats do not have the right to take away from Americans, uh, constitutional rights that were conferred as a, as a legacy, as a, a heritage um, by our founders. And it's, it's the, the most precious heritage we have. And unfortunately, like every other um, gift that was given to us in the 18th century, we have to fight to preserve those. If we get lazy or inattentive, those rights will be eroded if not taken away altogether. Absolutely. Um, I'm looking at the timer and I'm not sure I have uh, time for any more questions, but thank you so much for, for answering those so thoroughly. Well, thank you. Um, they were good questions. And thank you, Kristen, for joining us today. It's always so great to see you. Thank we're going to go time. now to our founder, actress Janine Turner, who I think is, is joining us by phone. Janine, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. All righty, I am zipping down uh, the interstate here, driving to Lubbock. So, uh, uh, the modern modern uh, science here. That oh, we may have just lost you, Janine. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yep, now we can. Uh, well, the Zoom was talking to. So anyway, uh, I, I want to go back to some very elementary questions for our youngsters that are listening, our students. But before I do that, I, I, I have a pressing question that builds upon the others. And if, if, if the SEC is not allowed to make law, and if they're not allowed to take away our Bill of Rights, you know, constitutional right for you know trial by jury, how did this happen? Um. Judicial um, deference, uh, and I mean that broadly. There's, um, I think the judges have been far too willing to let agencies get away with this. I mentioned that George Jarkissi challenged this right when he was charged by the SEC, and he lost before a panel that included um, Judge Ka then Judge Kavanaugh, and yet. Um, let's see, it was be 2023 when I brought the Cochran case to the Supreme Court, his earlier decision and that of six other circuits were unanimously reversed by the Supreme Court. This was not a, a split decision. And Justice Kagan said, it is illogical to require these people to go through these unconstitutional proceedings before they can challenge whether they're constitutional. <laughs> that's a problem. And, and, and to me, that seems so obvious that courts should step in and say, no, if you have a constitutional right that's being violated by an agency, you have a right to go to court in the first place and say, I want to vindicate my right to a jury trial. And yet he was denied that in 2014. 
and the Supreme Court um, almost, uh, let's see, it would be nine years later, said, of course, he has that right. So it's a, a disappointing record um, of judicial abdication, a protection of our um, of but our. If, if I may, if I may interject just real quickly, why did it happen in the first place? I understand the judges are, are say are, which we're saying it's OK to do some of them. Mm -hmm. um, there was judicial kind of, uh, you know, advocacy, so to speak. But how did it happen in the first place that they ever were allowed to set up uh, a jury, uh, not even a jury court, you know, this kind of, as you say, Kafka, Kafka is situation where uh, someone's trapped in a situation like this in a, in a, with one, one person, one judge making this decision with no, no jury trial by jury. How, forget about how the judges said it was okay to happen. How did it get met, passed and made in the first place? It started with the Roosevelt administration, which set up these administrative agencies and um, uh, preferred to let so-called experts um, decide these questions. They were controversial at the time. Um, one of the great Supreme Court justices, Robert Jackson, was objecting, uh, and he has a wonderful line in a 1937 decision saying, has the SEC become a law unto itself? So the warning signs were there all along, but the legislation that was passed under the Roosevelt uh, administration setting up these agencies uh, under a theory of administrative law that had been advanced by Woodrow Wilson, um, who was a big believer in uh, European style, German style administration uh, of law, which is utterly foreign to our way of judging and making law in this country, um, was able to really infect um, how our government works. And you see all those big buildings in Washington, D.C., filled with bureaucrats and administrators that are performing functions that the Constitution never contemplated. So you're saying Congress delegated that authority to, to the FEC? Yeah, and it's as I say, it started small. It was things like, well, you know, my registration lapsed, or, you know, I didn't uh, renew this, or, um, you know, some technical thing. And so people think, well, that's not a great big deal. But what James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and George Washington kept saying, there is this encroaching spirit of power. And once you give that agency the power to take away a person's livelihood uh, for, say, a registration problem, that will expand in time to charging them in quasi courts um, that aren't um, that do not even possess the judicial power. And this is. I think the central problem in the Jarkissi case is that Congress attempted to delegate judicial power to these administrative law courts. And if you study the Constitution, you know Congress itself doesn't have judicial power. Only the judicial branch does. So Congress was attempting to, de to delegate a power it doesn't even possess in the first place. That's how mixed up our law has become. Um, sorry, I just got completely lost as we were talking here. I, I don't know where I am. Um, well, the, um, okay. Well, okay, I now I have four fundamental questions. What does he want to accomplish with this court case that there could be no more of these courts or that someone has the option for a trial by jury if they so want it that there should be no more of these courts where the issue um, involves life liberty or property so um, I think the courts would probably remain able to uh, adjudicate minor questions having to do with you know the currency of, of your licensure but if it was charging you with fraud, which is a common law claim that was tribal to a jury in the 18th century, it has no power to adjudicate that. 
So it wants to eliminate these courts altogether. I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out where. Eliminate the courts altogether as to any kind of major civil uh, proceedings. Okay, eliminate the courts altogether. Okay, got it. Now, would you please explain to our students that are young and may not know? Uh, you're, it's hard for me to hear, but there's the SEC and then there's the SEC, correct? Are you so? Are you saying? Explain. There's Federal Exchange Commission, and then there's the Security Exchange Commission. There's the Federal Trade, right. the Federal Trade Commission, and then the Securities Exchange Commission. Those are two of the oldest agencies, but now there are hundreds of federal agencies, and many of them claim the same powers. Okay, explain these agencies for us, please. Well, there's what uh, is called the fourth branch of government. Um, we at the New Civil Liberties Alliance believe that that is illegitimate and that they do not have the power to regulate Americans by um, making law or adjudicating law. Now, there is the ability, they are in the executive branch so if they, um, if the president decides he wants to execute laws um, or enforce laws through such agencies, that is within the executive branch power, but they cannot either make law or adjudicate cases. But why were they created? What, what is the agency's function? Well, the agencies were um, seen as necessary to, um, attend to the details of governance, uh, that the uh, thought being that, you know, you don't want the president out there handling a customs claim or, um, you know, deciding uh, whether a certain uh, ship that has come in uh, comports with a, a trade agreement. So there do, do have to be administrators there who, who manage what the executive branch does. In my opinion, that is, um, can be accomplished by a very small group of, of people uh, in agencies, uh, in buildings that look nothing like what we see in, in Washington, DC. But you know, in, even, even in the time the uh, nation was founded, you had, for example, customs officials or um, you know, people boarding ships um, having to do with assessing whether there were taxable items um, on them. So some administration is uh, contemplated and uh, the founding, but nothing like what we see here. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be this alphabet soup of agencies. It could be, you know, basically presidential executive administrative um, offices uh, that that are under firm presidential control and that do not get out of hand on their own power. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna pass and uh, I'm really lost. So I'm gonna go figure out where I'm going. <laughs> okay, thank you. So <laughs> I'm much. sorry you got lost. <laughs> okay. Hope you make thank it to Lubbock. <laughs> okay. I know, well, I don't know where I'm going right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Bye -bye. Janine. Hello, uh, thank you so much for what you are doing. I hope all of everybody in our viewers realize um, how how amazing it is, how necessary it is. And it must be very hard, especially when you have to see things not get um, ruled the way that they should. But especially when you have to see what it does to individual people's lives, I can't really imagine. So uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Um, I have a question about these agencies and their power and what these individuals then um, and some of we 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 hear some more of these stories and some of us on this call probably thought that that the violation of our justice system the way that we see it is more of a new thing that it wasn't happening 10 years ago but then we hear about these cases that there are some times that it's been happening um has there been any ha have any of the people who were convicted in some of these on some of these um in some of these grounds has there ever been uh 
a reversal? Has there ever been a compensation? Has there ever been any anything we could point to where their lives are kind of put back together? Um, or do we need to, or is this need to be a much a much higher priority among voters because it's it's really destructive? I mean, that's a very good question you ask. Um, and I'm going to give you an example that happened in Mr. Jarkissi's case. And also, um, we know probably of many dozens of cases, okay? And, and it was a real injustice. Setting aside the structural problem, that you're not supposed to have these courts in the first place. During the case, the SEC had to disclose that it's... Um, enforcement staff had been accessing the judge's files. That's like cheating. That's if you were in court, that would be like the prosecutor going into the judge's chambers and rifling through his files. It was very disturbing. And the Wall Street Journal published an article about what a scandal this was. So when I won the Cochran case, which allowed my co client, Michelle Cochran, a Texan, to go into court and challenge the constitutionality of these uh, proceedings, and her files had also been invaded in this fashion, guess what happened? The SEC dismissed her case and didn't just dismiss her case, but all 42 open cases. That means nobody can find out what went on. This is shocking. There were congressional hearings on this, uh, the director of enforcement of the SEC was called before Congress, and he was flippant, evasive, and non-responsive as to what actually went on. My uh, firm has uh, Freedom of Information Act litigation going on in the District of Clem Columbia and Texas to try to find out what happened in the Jarkissi and Cochrane cases. So far, we have nothing after two years. So... Even when um, the SEC admits it has essentially cheated and invaded files, it will not give the public information about this. That is a frightening abuse of power and one we are determined to expose and get to the bottom of. Wow. All right, Jordan, do you want to follow yeah, that sure. up? Ben, I am just, it seems like information is so so available now but i consider myself as somebody that's in the know and i just haven't this has just not come up anywhere and it seems like it is such an important you know just such an important case and it's a constant repetitive problem so do you have any idea why uh it's just really not it's not available for us it's not in our faces to see there's so many news outlets, no matter what uh, what side you're on. Why is the information just not there uh, and presented as such a dire need as it is? I've got two good answers to your question, which is an excellent question. Yeah, how how did this happen? This is what Janine was asking. How did how could this possibly happen? Courts are open proceedings. The public can attend trials. It knows what's going on. And there is supervision of the courts, so they have to deliver justice in a reasonable period of time. These quasi-courts within in, uh, administrative agencies, there's no sunshine um, shown upon them. So people can get trapped in there for eight, 10 years and nobody knows it. But I'm gonna tell you something even more shocking that explains why we don't know about this. In 1973, the SEC passed a rule and it didn't do so by notice and comment so that people could comment on the rule and object to it if they felt it was not fair. It just popped it right in the federal register and said it was effective immediately. And do you know what that rule says? That if you settle your case with the SEC, you can never publicly criticize the agency for the rest of your life. When I learned that in 2018, I fired off a petition to the SEC to um, essentially um, annul nullify that gag rule. It said on that petition, 
for five years. I published an editorial in the Wall Street Journal about how the SEC hides criticism, because if you speak about the case and you criticize the SEC, they will reopen your prosecution and go right after you again. That is a shocking violation of the First Amendment. And that's why we don't know what goes on in these proceedings, because people are threatened with reopened prosecution. Now, NCLA, where I work, has had a little bit of success with this. We haven't yet won a case, but I have had two appellate judges on the Fifth Circuit say that this is a prior restraint and a shockingly effective one. There are judges on the Southern District of New York who have criticized what we call the gag rule. And right now, um, my firm is taking an appeal of the SEC's denial of my petition to take away the rule to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and we have amicus help from all kinds of organizations, and that will be filed in June. But that is the reason you don't know about these things, is that they have bound and gagged people who have had to settle their cases. And as Justice Gorsuch said in his 2023 opinion, the SEC's ability to outlast and outspend the people it charges means that it asks for and gets in settlement things it could never win in trial. And the gag is one of those. So that's it, it, that's the reason wow. They're, wow. they've been gagged. It is, uh, it seems like it's run as close as you could say a mob is. Exactly. Uh, that's the closest relative <laughs> I can give it. Um, that is, man, that's just flooring. It is. And real cases at the drop of a hat. Um, Kathy, I think it it's about time we jump to some audience questions. Uh, you've been a fantastic guest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your questions have been great. And it's so exhilarating to be able to talk about these things to young people where where in my hopes lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Jewel and Jorn and and Kristen and Janine for some great questions. And, and Peggy, uh, as Jordan said, you just such a great guest. Uh, before we go to the audience questions, we want to recognize our teachers and students who are with us today. And specifically, we want to recognize Cami Wainhouse uh, with a homeschool student today. So Cami, uh, we welcome you and your student watching. And if we have other teachers in uh, classrooms watching, please uh, message us in the Q&A and we'll make sure and give you a shout out before the end of the program. We also want to thank our listeners on Las Vegas' KKVV 1060 AM. This program airs Monday evenings at 6 p.m. Pacific. So thank you uh, to everyone in Las Vegas who listens uh, via KKVV. So Peggy, uh, Kay Morrison has an interesting question that might uh, show the other side a little bit. She, Kay Morrison asks, if the agencies lose authority through a SCOTUS decision, would that result in court substituting opinions for the judgments of experts? Is there going to be a problem uh, with, with courts that may not know as much about some of these issues trying to make uh, decisions in these cases? Well, that is um, the... The excuse given for administrative power has often been agency expertise. So when I took this job five years ago, I looked into the background of all five of the SEC's administrative law judges. Not one had any expertise at all whatsoever with the securities laws. Four of them came out of the Social Security Administration, and one of them came out of the Federal Communications um, Commission. Not one had any background in the securities law. So what we described that as being in our um, uh, our brief was the expertise emperor has no clothes. Very interesting. And that's a good way to describe it. Uh, Julian Smith asks, if Jarkissi wins, can he sue to get compensation for legal fees returned? <laughs> well, um, there is an Equal Access to Justice Act. It is very hard to win fees from the government and there's sovereign immunity very often. So unfortunately, um, those um, attempts to get that kind of compensation are long shots. Um, uh, a guy named Ray Lucia, who we represented, did vindicate his rights at the Supreme Court. He sought his Equal Access to Justice um, fees, and it was held that, well, it was a debatable question, so you don't get your fees. So 
I just have to say that's an, a long and uncertain road. Okay. Uh, and then Andrew Kay has a couple of questions. I'm going to ask both of them here. One is, does, doesn't the right to a jury trial apply only to legislated laws, not ones imposed outside of the legislative process? Well, jury trial rights by the terms of the Seventh Amendment say that if you have a right to uh, trial, if you had a right to trial by jury um, in uh, at common law in the uh, uh, essentially the 18th century, that was preserved. OK, so there have been arguments made that if there are new laws passed, um, they may or may not entitle you to a jury trial. The be better um, reading of that, in my opinion, and there's some cases, one is called Toll at the Supreme Court. And what Toll and it, cases like it say is if the new law basically codifies something that was always um, a violation at common law, the Congress can't um, take that old law, that old rule and clothe it in as legislation and then thereby strip you of your jury trial rights. So it would have to be an entirely new theory of law or cause of action. And most, um, most things the government would prosecute you for do fall in, in this case, into, uh, say, common law fraud. So I think that that's a very small universe of cases uh, where you wouldn't have a jury trial right. Okay, that's really interesting. Uh, Andrew also asks, is there any practical way in which this tangled mess of extra legal organizations and regulations can be undone? And how long could it be expected to take to do so? Well, um, I think it can be undone because the constitution and the documents to support it were very well thought through. And we have already seen success um, in, for example, in the, the case of getting judicial review of whether these uh, administrative courts comport with the constitution. Uh, we fought that for um, five years and got a unanimous decision from the Supreme Court. And I think there are many other areas like this that if you just fight hard enough and you are principled enough, because we have the truth on our side, we, we know that these powers were separated, not combined. And when they are combined uh, so that it does become a, um, a despotic or tyrannous uh, combination of powers, that we have the wonderful text of the constitution and the commentaries on the constitution to support us in extricating the Americans from the grasp of these um, overpowerful and encroaching uh, agencies. Well, thank you for that. And um, Whitney Mason asks, as she'd like to learn, and this is a, a little bit outside the subject, but it does have to do with the SEC. Uh, she asks, I'd like to learn more about why someone who runs a fixed income business regulated by the SEC, why they are barred from any political activity, such as becoming a precinct chap captain. Do you know much about that? Why, why the SEC uh, so strongly uh, prohibits political activity? No, and I think that's got to be per se unconstitutional. I, I had mentioned earlier the gag rule, mm -hmm. and we we think that um, the gagging people as a condition of settlement is an unconstitutional condition. And the reason we brought the case in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is the Ninth Circuit had two cases that seemed to me to be very much uh, along the lines of what is is the question is here. In one case. <laughs> um, a condition of settlement of a case required uh, the party to agree to never criticize a county commissioner or their family again in the future. And the court held that was an unconstitutional condition and they set it aside. Another one held that as a condition of settlement with the government, a person had to agree that they would not run for public office in the future. Again, that was held by the court as a per se unconstitutional condition. And all I can say is um, 
what was described in this con this uh, question sounds to me like an unconstitutional condition. There's absolutely no power for a mere administrative agency, much less a Congress couldn't tell you, you can't engage in po political activity, um, you know, just because you run a certain kind of business. And so I, I, I think that's got to be um, invalid. Well, thank you for that. And um, Julianne Smith wrote a, in a comment, she said, this case is so important there are so many important cases before the Supreme Court this year to roll back administrative state and administrative power. And is the new Civil Liberties Alliance, and we'd love for you just to talk for a minute about just broadly the work that you all do. We um, we explored two cases earlier uh, in this series of important uh, Supreme Court decisions that are being considered. Uh, the EPA case, which is the, uh, the good neighbor, um, the downwind industrial pollution case. And then uh, also this uh, the case having to do with the uh, Chevron doctrine, I think. Um, are y'all working uh, with with in doing things with those cases as well? Yes, the Chevron case is two cases. And one's called Loper Bright, and the other is Relentless. And Relentless is our ship. It's it's a maritime case, and we represent uh, Relentless. Um, and we have been in the forefront of challenging Chevron deference. Um, that was um, um, really a founding goal. Um, our, our organization was founded in 2017 by Professor Philip Hamburger, who teaches law at Columbia, who wrote a book that was receiving a lot of attention called, Is Administrative Law Unlawful? And the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> and uh, it's, it was a very influential book. Judges were reading it, scholars were reading it and debating it. And Philip decided, well, you know, it's one thing to write a book and theorize. It's another thing to do something about it. So he founded our organization in 2017. I was the first attorney hired. And in the first brief I filed at the Supreme Court, I investigated the background of the SEC administrative law judges and made the point that the, the um, expertise emperor had no clothes <laughs> and that they were biased and that they, uh, there's no way a person brought before such a court could ha possibly have a fair and unbiased trial. So yes, we were founded to um, uh, get rid of things like Chevron deference. And, and by the way, there are many kinds of, of deference. Chevron's the only the name of one of them. There's brand X deference and a dizzying number of deference doctrines in which courts defer to agencies and, and Every one of them is in our sights uh, to to um, take down. So yes, um, we we are very involved in those any kind of administrative power case that uh, challenges the constitutionality of uh, administrative power, whether it comports with the con uh, constitution separation of powers, um, what we like to call the vesting of lawmaking power in Congress and Congress alone. And, um, and these agencies have possess no lawmaking power whatsoever. And every time they try to exercise that, we are going to attempt to be on the other side of that equation. Well, thank you. And y'all do such great work. And we are right at the top of the hour. And we just appreciate so much your time today. We just want to tell our audience one more time, if you want to learn more about Peggy's organization, it is the New Civil Liberties Alliance. And I, you're, do you want to say your website, Peggy? Yes, it's www.ncla.org. And um, uh, we have a lot. We do, we have our own YouTube channel. We have um, small movies we make about our cases. We have done cartoons about the SEC gag rule. Um, we've got a whole bunch of, of, of stuff that I think would be uh, public relations and um, educational materials that would be very helpful for your audience. So yeah. I encourage you to go there. Thank you so much. And we encourage everybody to join us next week, Tuesday at 2 Eastern. Uh, and we're going to be talking about another Supreme Court case that will be decided soon. I think it's been in the news recently is uh, homeless encampments and, uh, and that whole issue. So anyway, thank y'all. And uh, thank you.
Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you so much.